Welcome back from the first couple of talks. We have the first discussion session today, which is going to be orbital evolution. And it's me and Selma here who is in charge. And my name is Sophie. I'm a PhD student from University of Copenhagen. I specifically work at DARK and the Nils Bohr Institute. Um, and I work on basically all things stellar evolution, but binary stellar evolution and doing a lot of hydrodynamic simulations of the interactions between the two stars, basically. Um, and that's me, I'm about to finish. <laughs> My name is Selma de Mink. For those who you uh, don't uh, know me, I think Sophie and I both have an interest in, in what stars do when they are alive. And I think some of them share that, some of you share that with us, but there's also a lot of people with a different uh, background and perspective. So uh, in the opening, we want to set the scene a little bit uh, to acknowledge how the, the audience that we have, if this is working from this distance, <laughs> which you tested. So, so this is, uh, so we've been here two weeks already. Uh, at the KTP workshop. And so a lot of the things that uh, I think for us were triggered, triggered these, these discussions uh, came up in the discussions last two weeks. And so uh, many of the people that uh, opened uh, discussed the meeting here as, as sort of two groups or communities coming together. And so one is sort of represented by this uh, scientist, we, we, we might as well call her uh, Caitlin. Uh, let me stand here. Uh, so there's a group that really comes from sort of star and planet formation. And there's at least one group here, we could call them then, or uh, uh, that is uh, coming from the area of supermassive black holes. Uh, and, and let's make this interactive right away. Who belongs to uh, sort of the Caitlin group here? If you want to raise your hands, get a little feeling. That's a couple of people. What is Do you mostly belong in this category? Then, then I think that's it. <laughs> that's it. And then we, we have the then group here. Who belongs to the then group here? <laughs> and so who of you doesn't belong to any of these groups? So, so I want to acknowledge this for a moment. There is a group in between, and, and this may take different shapes, but for Sophie and me, maybe this picture illustrates it. It's stars, yes, but it's not a star formation process. It's stars that uh, really do a lot of things, that can throw out matter, that uh, can shine, that can radiate. Uh, and so in that sense, well, young stars can do that as well. But I think in this stage, we're in a different stage. The origin of a potential circumbinary disk is different. And so I have to acknowledge Dan here as well for the discussion on Friday to call this uh, not outside in disk formation, say gas coming up in cloud outside or from, a, from your galaxy feeding the binary. In this case, there may be circumbinary disks that are inside out. And so these stars may be feeding uh, that circumbinary disk. And so with that, uh, this is, Sophie and I have thought of a few topics, but we wanted to start uh, this, this uh, calm. So I mean, think this inside out phenomena is fun to talk about because it really raises different questions. And are these disks different? And are the processes different? And in the end, we're here to talk about physics. And, and so I think this will trigger a lot of physics that in the end, many of us are interested in. Um, so the role of stellar processes is roughly the theme for the whole day, but we can take that broadly. We're also open to anything raised by the speakers. And I'll say one more thing about the style, and then Sophie will introduce a little bit what we think about inside out. So uh, I, I wanted to start with this cartoon. This is a discussion session. You're welcome to speak up if you're one of the first speakers or if you have in-depth questions. I also want to encourage you to ask questions just to clarify concepts of phenomena. So in particular, if you're not an expert on the topic so far and you have a question that you think is helpful to make the discussion more accessible for everyone, then please uh, don't be afraid to speak up. Uh, so that is uh, one. I, I don't think I have to uh, encourage the ex expert here to speak up. They probably do it by themselves. And in particular, if you're an early career researcher, if you feel like an early career researcher and you have a question, then you're also very welcome to join. And let me also encourage anyone who's more <laughs> shy or quiet in, in uh, general terms. Then I think I'll move it to yeah. science motivation. For yeah, yeah. So uh, the science motivation for this discussion from Selma and I is, is basically stellar evolution and the processes that happens during stellar evolution, which all include a lot of mass loss, basically. So this phenomenon of creating 
uh, outside in? No, inside out. <laughs> I'm keeping on mixing up. But basically, the mass is coming from the binary and leaving the binary, and that way forming a disk rather than having an inflow of material. And this happens quite often during a process during stellar evolution, which can end up leading to these like really amazing LIGO observations. All these double compact objects go through a lot of these phases of mass loss, and then that way forming giant circumbinary disks. And a few of the examples that I just could think of here is like when we have evolutionary processes such as common envelope, which is basically you have a companion going in and whipping the outer layers of a giant star and that way expelling a lot of material. You can also have stellar winds, which really are mass loss, but because you have a companion in there, you get these very nice spiral waves that are focusing material in the orbital plane again. And also just my personal, pref uh, like my, my baby, is when you have supernovas in binaries, but you still have some fallback material and you get these very nice mini disks around each uh, black hole. But in all these cases, you're not getting these very beautiful uh, flat thin disks. You're getting something that is more like these very fluffy disks, right? You're not getting just these perfect disks that we can simulate in circumbinary disks, but more very extended fluffy material where you would expect to have something more than what Nathan was showing us before. You have both direct and fall, and you also have some accretion. But this is where we sort of wanted to start off because this is my the end of my knowledge. I don't know what happens with this material. Uh, so some of the things we were thinking of discussing is what really happens once you have that material sitting out there in these very fluffy disks. Is that a good start? Um, so I was just wondering so far, does anyone have any comments they would like to start us discussing here? I'll put some, we put some suggestions up here, but like it's free for everyone now to start bringing in. Uh, we can also start with what we had before from the, the third law, Newton's third law. Any discussions here would also fit. <laughs> Do you want to start with a question? Uh, we, we're not going to uh, pose the questions here. We have not uh, <laughs> proposed, uh, uh, we have not prepared more than this, so we'll feed it from here. So I think we're starting with a question uh, uh, on Zoom. Uh, Rajika Kuruvita, go ahead. Uh, hi, sorry, this is a question that I wanted to ask Roman, and I did message him, but uh, in response to Dong Lai's question about the formation of these discs around the post AGB stars, you actually mentioned it yourself. I remember. And when I used to investigate post common binaries, that um, there was this problem with uh, unbinding the envelope of massive stars, where your simulations would be able to lift the envelope but not fully unbind it, so we'd expect it to fall back eventually. Um, so I was like investigating potentially these fall back disks forming around these young post common envelope binaries, um, and that you might have multiple episodes of this to help unbind. But um, yeah, so these. Uh, Dong Lai was saying, you know, is is it inside out or is it outside in? So I, it, I feel like it would be some contribution uh, of this inflow from the envelope, the bound envelope material, but also the material escaping through the L2. Um, but I don't know. I haven't worked on post kind of envelope binaries in a while. I don't know if this unbinding of the envelope is still a big problem. So maybe you can update me. Do you want to respond, Roman? Uh, yeah, I can certainly tell you that I'm... Uh, also not an expert on this uh, topic from my point of view, you know, the problem that I was trying to solve was just, you know, in placing a disk of a given mass at this location and, uh, you know, thinking about what would be the consequences, how it would be uh, turning into an excretion disk, how it would be uh, expanding, carrying angular momentum and so on. So unfortunately, I would not be able to add uh, much on this. I guess uh, people who actually do simulations of this uh, process of unbinding process might be more uh, knowledgeable and might suggest something. Uh, another issue is, you know, you have to be careful whether the simulations which are done to cover this problem actually do include all the physics. Uh, you know, there are sort of potentially, you know, like things like radiation pressure on dust grains, you know, thermodynamic effects and so on and so forth. So I would also be happy to hear the opinion of an experts or possible experts on this topic in the audience, if there are any. Someone who wants to respond. I know. I'm just going to bring the microphone near an expert on simulations of common envelope things, perhaps. He wants to say a few words. 
Okay. He doesn't want to say a few words. He's got his own discussion session. He has a discussion section after this. Uh, I'm, should, I, should I approach yeah, observers who, do, uh, who know about AGB stars? Max, should I come around to you? Do you want to chime in? Yeah, so some um, more background on these post AGB binaries. Um, they're FGK. Uh, giants, you know, uh, and they're trying to zoom across the HR diagram. Um, but there's this cluster, these clusters of these post-AGB binaries. Um, and so there has to be some kind of reseeding of material onto that post-AGB binary, other, or post-AGB star. Um, otherwise, we would not see them. They would just get hotter and become a planetary nebula. Um, and so there's definitely evidence that there's inward even though they came from mass loss out of this L2 point, that, you know, making the certain binary disk, there's also some mechanism that's draining material from that, from that disk back onto uh, the post agb star. Um, so that's all some context I just want to add about these post agb binaries. Yeah, so the uh, AGB stars, the post agb stars are very exciting uh, 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 post common envelope uh, systems, but Co common envelope would be a wider topic, right? We may also have cases where there's O stars inside uh, that may have a chance to drive away this excess material. And it's less clear to me whether that would fall back. Right, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Sorry, I don't know anything about these systems, but it just occurred to me that what I do know a little bit about is the difference between gas and dust. And um, I know that AGB stars supposedly form dust. So I just wonder whether the fallback could be dust. Um, so the dust falls back, but the gas doesn't, right? In the sense that um, we know that dust in spirals in uh, protoplanetary disks due to the difference between ballistic velocities and <clears throat> um, gas circular velocities, you get the gas drag. So I wonder whether potentially you could be forming dust in these um, winds and then the dust could spiral back in and that would explain the pollution that you're getting. I don't know. I don't know if there's someone at Dong is more than this. You wanna oh, yeah. yeah, so I'm I'm not sure I understand about AGB, but if you just consider binary evolution, right? Two binary and this small guy began to expand began to transfer mass from L1 and began to also transfer out mass from L2. In that case, you know, you form a disk around the binary. And uh, I'm not sure, I think in that case, A dot should be negative because uh, the reason, the reason in a lot of time when we do bin certain binary simulation, you get A dot being positive is because you have equation, right? Right, and uh, the, the, the A dot usually have two contributions. One is from gravitational torque, Right, this gravitational torque, you have fast, rota fast, fast rotating binary impacting with a slow rotating gas outside. The gravitational torque is always such that the, the binary losing angular momentum. But then the reason you get A dot B positive in a lot of the simulations is because you have a question, right? Now going back to this uh, mass loss on L2, it seems that uh, you know, it's, it's being lost. Why is coming, if it's not coming back, then you don't get, uh, obviously you don't get, you always get A dot B negative, since the sign should always be negative. So my question then is, uh, I think maybe some of you know, you still know this thing. I think to remember, you know, people have been talking binary evolution, you know, people, I think maybe long term, you know, some binary white dwarf and the thing, and then they, they need the mechanism to make the object decay, right? And then they therefore, they're, that's often the invoked, the, the gas, surrounding the binary. People, there are even some attempt to try to detect it. This is like 10 years ago. Maybe. Um, so I, I'm just uh, wondering what's the status of that kind of systems. And, uh, from sort of population point of view, is there any needs? Is there, you know, given all the knobs you have in the binary evolution, <laughs> is there any, <laughs> sorry, I'm not, I'm not being, <laughs> I'm just saying that not, is there any sort of a, crisis or some problems that you need something to, during mass transfer process, you need some additional thing to, to make the orbit evolve. I mean, you know this kind of thing. 
So I can uh, respond from sort of a, a population modeling or, or 1D perspective, but if somebody's modeling this in more dimension than one, they, they should jump in uh, uh, after me. Uh, Pablo may also want to discuss this. Um, do we need it? Well, there's a fair amount of uncertainties in, in when, when, when binaries exchange mass. Uh, and one of them is how much mass you lose from the system. And the second one is how much angular momentum does it take away? And uh, if material would be lost through an outer Lagrangian point thrown into a disk, you can lose a lot more angular momentum than when this would be in the form of a wind of one of the stars or from maybe from the accretion disk. What is the state of the field? In, in 1D simulations, we are obviously not modeling this explicitly, but we can take into account sort of a, a, uh, the concept that if mass is lost, that it would be in a circumbinary disk, and therefore it would, this would be the DADT that you, uh, this would be the specific angular momentum of that material, and therefore it would shrink. Do we need it from a population standpoint? Yeah. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, do we need it from a population standpoint? We would like to make gravitational wave sources and compact objects that close uh, binaries inside uh, planetary nebula. So there's definitely moments uh, where you have. Uh, high angular momentum loss, whether that's a standard common envelope or something that's more disk-like, I don't know. And then I think somebody wants to respond at the end. Yes. Ah, Savik. Exactly on, oh, exactly on that point, just to, just to make a slight comment, obviously this is not a near-term observational constraint, but um, there is a, some work uh, led by Matthew Renzo uh, looking at the possible detectability in LISA of white dwarf of, well, of stellar cores during a common envelope stage by LISA, both the detectability and distinguishability of it. And, the, and obviously if that was detectable as something other than a vanilla vacuum white dwarf binary uh, and distinguishable as something other than that, um, you could get some really exquisite measurements, for example, of the eccentricity and the inclination, et cetera, et cetera, and sort of infer some things about the gas dynamics in that context. Obviously, that's a long way off, but I did just want to point out that it's not, you know, forever in the imaginary future. Yeah, an exciting idea. Um, so one of the discussions, do we need it, is what Dong asked. And so I was wondering if uh, Catherine would be... Uh, interested to say something about the disk that you see in uh, SS4 through 3. Is that something you want to, and why don't you use mine for the moment? Thank you very much. It's clear that the circumbinary disk that we see in the microquasar SS4 through 3 has exhibits significant excretion. The mass loss from it is um, a few times 10 to the minus 4. What is SS4 um, to answer the question, what is SS433? Um, gosh, you're missing out if, if that's a question you're asking. Um, SS433 is a microquasar. It's a system that ejects oppositely directed jets, which move at speeds between 0.2 C and well above 0.3 C on occasion. We believe that the principal binary components are a black hole of 16 solar masses and a pillaged star of about 24 solar masses. Some years ago, we discovered a circumbinary disk around this object. Um, in via spectroscopy. Um, but if you then look at the nucleus of this microquasar with milli arc second radio imaging, then you see that there is emission that uh, optically thin Bremsstrahlung emission uh, that moves away approximately perpendicularly uh, to the jet axis and uh, the mass loss that you can account uh, for with both of these observations, in fact, is about 10 to the minus four solar masses per year. So pretty, pretty hefty mass loss. Whether there's accretion also arising from this same circumbinary disk 
is not something we yet have evidence for. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, draw a distinction between two types of common envelope situations. Um, there can be a common envelope that uh, goes back to uh, Stryker and Pachinsky, where you have, say, a star that becomes a red giant, and then there was a nearby star uh, companion. And then you have two stars orbiting within this spherical uh, accumulation of material that uh, is very uh, much like a background gas that the two stars are continuously orbiting and running into. The other type that I think you are really referring to has to do with something that you encounter in what are called contact binaries, which are binaries that share a common envelope of material that's nearly co-rotating with the binary. And th for that, the L2 point is very critical and limits the extent to which the binary can expand. And in that case, you get a gas stream coming out from the binary that can form a circuit binary disk. So I, I just wanted to make that distinction. <clears throat> so hi, it's Aileen again. Um, so I had a question, I don't know, um, uh, what is expectation for these systems uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, mergers? Uh, so, uh, how, many, how many of these binaries will merge uh, um, uh, directly before evolving uh, uh, as, as, as single black holes? Uh, is that substantial? Is a negligible fraction? I, I think that's a really exciting question. I don't know the answer. Uh, I think it will be a very large fraction, like a, I, I'm a massive star person, right? So for stars over 15 solar masses, about seven out of 10 have some type of interaction, but of the order of half may go through such a dramatic interaction that the stars would be driven together if we run sort of uh, binary models or population synthesis. Uh, don't, don't pin me down on the half, it could be a third, or but it could be really large fraction of the massive stars that go through this. For low mass stars, I think maybe somebody else could uh, answer that. Are you... Uh, Yeah. That's his uh, Matteo Renzo in the chat says 20 to 30 percent. For uh, high mass stars, it could be higher and, and 15 percent. Matteo Renzo and I work with the same simulation, so we. <laughs> it's a sizable channel, says uh, Elena Rossi. For yes. Very massive stars. Yeah. Okay. Which is maybe an interesting point that we can possibly discuss further later is. Uh, if we want to see evidence for circumbinary disk, one of the evidence to look for is to look for stellar mergers that didn't survive the DADT being negative because it, they pushed them uh, so far together. Gravitational wave sources is something that survived it the whole life and only did it at the end. Uh, but the stars can be smashed together also before. Uh, yeah. But, uh, while the microphone is running there, we also can still take uh, questions for the, the both speakers, but... Uh... Is it my turn? Hi. Oh, yeah. Um, Magdalena Schiebeck. I wanted to ask something about um, the jets that were mentioned previously. Uh, I forgot the name of the system, but um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if people are already looking at um, how jets and winds are affecting the orbital evolution, the, um, the shrinking of the binary orbit, and what's known about that? Is there someone who would like to take this question? How do jets and winds affect the orbital evolution? Uh, yes. Oh, hi, so Pablo Martant here. Um, I would say jets and winds essentially change orbital evolution by removing angular momentum from the system. If in particular you expect to have jets, 
yet are expected to go very fast compared to the orbital velocity. So they're essentially like an instantaneous mass ejection that doesn't interact with the orbit. So in those situations, it's more or less, if one knows the mass loss rate from the jet, it's easy to follow up how the orbital evolution goes. Um, because one knows the angular momentum that is being lost. And typically the evolution then, whether or not it's increasing the ADT or decreasing, it's uh, quite sens sensitive on mass ratio of the system. Let me oh. just respond to Pablo for one oh. second. So the mass ratio, uh, it can be a bit abstract, but uh, there's a sort of a visual picture I have that makes me at least remember it. If this is a donor star that's not losing, if, if, if you lose mass in the vicinity of, of the second star, and that's the low mass star, then the massive star sitting in the center of mass, this low mass star is the one that makes a large orbit. Which, uh, <laughs> sorry, that was not on, on purpose. So if you would lose mass from the lower mass companion in the vicinity, it would have the angular momentum of that orbit, and you drain a lot of angular momentum, much more than the average from the system. And this is how the mass ratio uh, uh, matters. So that's what you were saying, but I, this picture helped me a lot. Max wants to respond. Yeah, to it was very similar. I just want to ask about this. It depends on what your specific angular momentum is. If you just lose mass from a, one of the stars, the orbit will widen. Um, but if you carry enough angular momentum from that mass loss, it, 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 can, it can shrink. So how does the specific angular momentum tie into of mass loss tie into the mass ratio dependence that you were saying? Are you, is your question, how does the specific angular momentum tie into the mass ratio, is that what you're uh, saying? How does, do we know the specific angular momentum of the, of the jets or accretion winds, mass loss from this, so that we know what direction A dot would be? I think Sterl will be giving the answer or not. <laughs> well, I, I guess there's a, the, the simple picture is if you have a very low mass system, you consider a satellite orbiting the sun or something, if it loses mass isotropically, there's no effect on the orbit. If you lose mass from the sun, the orbit expands. Um, and there's a formula which interpolates between those two. And there's also a paper by Soberman, Finney, and Van den Heuvel from long ago, which parameterizes all of these things with notorious Greek letters, which are found in Mesa, which enables you to simulate any of those in a parameterized way. <laughs> Anyone feels in need of their practicing the Greek alphabet, I, I uh, recommend it. There, oh yeah, Andre, hey, I guess. Uh, hi, Andre Becker. So I have a um, question about some, maybe something slightly different, but motivated by uh, Roman's talk in the morning, uh, where Roman said that the disk masses around the post-AGB stars are very small, like 10 to minus 3 or 10 to minus 4 solar masses. Uh, and I find this surprising because uh, the AGB star was supposed to lose, uh, you know, much higher amount of mass. And a similar situation, I guess, might be in the setting of a supernova fallback, where supernova ejects a lot of mass and maybe only a very small fraction comes back. And I guess another situation is, uh, is planets around pulsars, where the masses of the planets are, again, very small compared to the mass of supernova ejecta. So I find this... Uh, personally very puzzling because uh, and also hard to investigate numerically because it's like you know big number goes out and we are left with a small number so my question is whether uh, we in general have a good understanding in terms of theory of uh, and I guess predictive power in the sense of uh, you know can we predict how much mass is left behind around the binary in events like this thanks Sophie, do you want to respond? <laughs> uh, so I can tell you the answer for the simulations I have done in fallback supernovae, at least. We found that it, really the amount of material that ends up in these mini disks around the companions are roughly the amount that the binary has time to torque before the fallback. So it depends on how fast your fallback happens. But for the simulations I did, it was about half a solar mass, even though we were ejecting like 10 solar mass worth of material through the supernova ejecta which I think is like, that qualifies as a very small amount of mass. That's, you know, the disks ends up being fairly small, but they're, you know, efficiently and they stay there, even though the orbit is very eccentric afterwards. So uh, is that an answer to your, that's what I, the part that I know, at least. I think for these more like 
violent events such as common envelope there's a lot more mass around and it really still seems to me like it's a unsolved how much of that material is really ejected from the binary and how much of it will fall back so we have two questions on zoom and and brian just raised his hand so maybe he's closest to this topic if that's right then brian will go first and then nathan you'll be next sorry nathan didn't mean to leave probably yeah it was related oh. to the topic I, I, <laughs> I, I mean i don't know the question to, to andre's answer um but you know i i think that in, in any of these common envelopes we're forming i think you said this earlier some of very hot stars and so i think these discs are subject to to very strong uh, evaporation and, and other processes I, I remember with the i don't know much about the post agbs but i remember that they're i believe volatile rich meaning uh, op opposite to what was suggested earlier i think there's evidence that the dust is actually being blown out of these systems that's the, for the gas that's actually accreting onto the to, to the central object, I could be mistaken, but um, um, but yeah, that was just my my broader point is, and I think it's probably also true in a lot, a lot of these systems that we have to not only study the effects of these discs uh, as they're accreting or gaining, uh, adding in momentum to the binary, but also what the central stars are, are evaporating mass from these discs. So I think that's that's maybe one of the challenges. Um, anyway, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thanks, Brian, which makes me worry that there's a bias because the material that's flowing out, we don't see it. The material that comes back, we will see it for longer. So I'm, I don't know what we should take from the post-AGB binaries for all the other circumbinary discs that we're talking about. Uh, Nathan, I guess. Yeah, I, I agree with Brian, but inevitably to answer the question, obviously, I think you have to specify more about the parameters, the orbital parameters of the binary, the component masses, and exactly what kind of mass loss you're talking about. So I'm, you mentioned jets, which we may naively, depending on the energetics of the jets, we could naively expect radio emission where there wouldn't be any in, in other such systems, but that requires them to be sort of heavy remnants, right? So I, I think to answer the question properly, you really need to, uh, there's a huge parameter space exploration here. I guess I would ask if anybody, like, so like are stars losing mass spherically symmetrically? Are they losing mass non-spherically symmetrically? Um, is it continuous? Is it discrete? Things like that. Yeah, thanks Nathan uh, for emphasizing that. Sultan? Well, actually I have a different question. So. Oh. The only thing I wanted to say that, that there is indeed enormous diversity here in the types of sources inside. So, uh, well, I'm just repeating what Nathan already said. Yeah, I, had a, I had a quick follow up to Elena's question of how many of the massive binaries merge due to these disks. And I didn't know much about this, but I learned in the last two weeks that most massive stellar binaries actually have a tertiary companion. <laughs> So does that actually change the story or is the third object usually too far to affect uh, this particular aspect? So uh, the, the circumbinary binary disk fall back and merger? I could quote- and Maybe Matthew is the, I don't know, maybe Matthew knows about this. Uh, Max Moe, I would quote his paper, but he can probably summarize the punchline himself. Massive what fraction whether, of tertiaries? Whether, so we heard that 20 or 30% of the massive stars merge due to the circumbinary disk. Is, does the number include the tertiary and does that matter? Wait, so the numbers okay. we quoted is, is the merger because of the stars swelling up and angular momentum lost just by throwing it out of the system. That is not because of circumbinary disk yet and not because of tertiary yet. They would increase the numbers that me and Mathieu were quoting. <laughs> so how much worse do triples make it? <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, uh, um... Let's see, uh, Fabio Antonini, his uh, graduate student, just uh, submitted a paper looking at the enhancement of binary interactions due to the tertiary. Because uh, when we say 70% of massive stars are in uh, close binaries, I would also say 70% of massive stars are in triples, where the tertiary is at least 10% the mass uh, of, of the primary. So there's um, a lot of mass out, out there as well that can affect the evolution of the inner binary. Um, and, and so, yeah, right now it's looking like a slight enhancement from that 20, 30% that evolved through common envelope. 
on the, the uh, solitary binary evolution. So we have another expert online, Sylvia Tone, and I didn't know you were here, but you are definitely the person to answer this, uh, Sylvia. Hey, everyone. Um, I don't know if you can see or hear me. We see, yes, we see and hear you. <laughs> so, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what uh, Maximo uh, was saying. And so I think some interesting uh, other numbers to mention is how often it happens for a third star to fill its rush slope and starts transferring mass to the inner binary. And so from simulations as well, actually, um, based on observations as well, we know that this happens in several percents of all triples. You know, several percents by itself doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're talking about several percent of the full population of all triples, that is actually quite a lot. And then we did some follow-up work uh, with Nathan Lee. Actually, he's the lead author, so uh, all credit uh, should go to Nathan in this sense, where uh, we investigated to see how often this would happen with um, an inner binary that already went through several phases of mass transfer and so contains compact objects, and the number increased. So the estimate was roughly up to 10% of double wide dwarfs would experience this mass transfer from uh, from the third tree. And so, yeah, just to add to what Maximo is saying, there will be an, uh, an increase in uh, the type of interactions, different types of interactions, and uh, yeah, we have to see how much uh, the increase is. I think you changed this to outside in again because you're feeding now the inner binary. But, uh, yeah. Thanks, Sylvia, for that contribution. We had some questions that people were not able to answer. I think, Elena, you also, a few people were trying to ask questions here for the talks earlier. We also have room for those if those are still urgent. <laughs> okay. Just to quickly chime in, I just put the paper that Sylvia was talking about in the chat if anybody's interested. On the Slack channel, I included a list of about seven or so different papers that discuss uh, Rochelle overflow from a tertiary onto the inner binary. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll check. And, 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 that, and that, I think that's included, but please, please, please check. All right, thanks. And we have just to let you know, we have another five minutes before we change to the next discussion session. And I'll just remind those of you who are fortunate to be in the room that I know you've all gotten used to staring at your computer screens while having scientific meetings, but you have an opportunity not to do that today. So <laughs> take advantage. <laughs> Wise word. So one of the discussions we had on Friday, which was somewhat related to this theme that, that triggered at least part of my contribution to this slide is, Matthew Bates was one of the people asking, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm distracted by something I see, uh, is asking, is this even a disk? And so there's also a sort of continuum for binaries where there is basically a spherical outflow. Common envelope evolution may be quite spherical if you're a little bit further away than uh, L2. There, there, there might be case of thin disk, but, but some of these disks will be extremely uh, wide and broad. Uh, to the extent, Matthew, I think you even questioned, is this even a disk at all uh, or, or last Friday? Sorry if I'm paraphrasing you uh, incorrectly. I, I'm not sure if we're allowed to uh, discuss these uh, uh, non-spherically symmetric but still somewhat planar outflows as disk in this meeting. Definitely allowed, yeah. <laughs> totally allowed. Do you want to comment on this or differences or...? Well, not not really. I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't know these systems, but it just seems to me that, you know, particularly in the case of winds, um, then there's no reason it should be thin, obviously. And But then in these winds, you also get the spiral shapes, and whenever you have spirals, you can potentially transport angular momentum with spirals as well through torques, for example. So um, I don't know. I'll just follow up on that. One of the things that we talked about both this morning and we've talked about in this workshop the last couple of weeks is the idea that the behavior of these systems depends on parameters like the mass ratio, effective viscosity, and the aspect ratio. And so trying to unite these things, I think, is a particularly useful thing to do, considering is this is this H over R of unity? Yes. Is it the same physics? What H over R is spherical? Or... <laughs> Sophie, did you want to bring up something on the... Spiral arms still? No, okay. 
we have one more, someone online. Hi, Yang Wang. Oh, hi, and uh, hi, Owen. And uh, curious about, uh, you know, if uh, material is fast flowing from the star, you have this star shape. And after your, you tend to form a certain binary disk, uh, after the inflow, will this uh, spiral feature from the outflow have some consequence on the, because I think perhaps this info of uh, the commander disk will not be uh, like homogeneous from each direction. Oh, interesting question. In homogeneity and spiral structures triggered by the feeding of the disk or, or that, that form later in the disk? Is there someone who wants to respond to this? Who's actually modeling this? I'm looking at you, Matthew. I don't know. Uh, no. Is there any of the, most of the AGN disks uh, that are being simulated here are, are smooth, I presume, apart from instabilities that are forming by itself? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to make conversation. I might not say very smart. Uh, <laughs> at least I triggered someone. That's, uh... Oh, did, did I hear you say that AGN disks are smooth? <laughs> that was not quite what I meant, but I, uh, I can imagine they're much more clumpy than some of the observ than some of the simulations take into account. Right. I mean, well, you'll you'll hear my talk on Tuesday, but that you know there should be very solid things in those disks that will um, contribute to a lot of lumpiness and clumpiness um, that that is going to complicate any sort of smooth gas modeling. Um, Certainly, certainly for AGN disks, and then they have the same sorts of impacts where, you know, if you stick a planet in a protoplanetary disk or something, then you develop spiral arms and move angular momentum around, and it's all horrible. So, I don't know if that helps you any. Probably not. <laughs> oh. uh, any sense anyway? Ayan, did you want to respond or? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, but uh, I'm still curious about this uh, because, well, you know, uh, when we do simulations, we all always provide a as so homogeneous condition, right? Material flowing, falling in from the outwards, but perhaps this could change the future. Anyway, uh, Is someone who wants to respond. I, I just point out, certainly in, you know, star formation cluster simulations, the inflow is not quite so homogeneous. Um, that's, a, that's a different scale and a different scenario, but in principle, you know, those, those simulations have been, those things have been looked at. Cases where you end up with tilting disks, you know, Ma Matthew showed some simulations of that earlier today as well. One of the examples may be this uh, spiral structures. I, I think it's Wolverine binaries uh, and maybe also AGB binaries, but you really have this spiral structure in the outflow that is probably even the hose. That's the way I understood it. Brian? Yeah, so maybe you've already talked about this at this meeting, but what happens in these circumbinary disk simulations when the disk is self-gravitating? Uh, <laughs> speaking of non, <laughs> non-axisymmetric uh, instabilities and things, I, I know that that can be potentially a uh, regime in the supermassive black hole case, presumably protoplanetary case. So what have people talked about the impacts uh, on the torques when the disk is, is uh, transport yeah. is not some kind of alpha viscosity, but. Um. Well, yeah, I, I can comment about this. Uh, Alberto Cesana and one of his postdocs was also my collaborator. Oh yeah, I'm Alessandro Lupi here from the University of Milano Bicocca. Um, they've studied um, circumbinary disks, including self-gravity around massive black hole binaries. Uh, and also including uh, cooling of the of the disk, uh, not assuming an isothermal equation of state, and they found that s there are spiral arms forming, and, and the, the disk is becoming thinner, and the torques provided also by the spiral arms can help the binary to shrink. Okay, we are reaching the end of our uh, part. I, I have one comment to, to give you. I think this is for to make uh, Catherine happy, but if you don't know about this system, this is the system <laughs> I think Catherine thinks we should all know, and I, I very much agree with her. So this is, I think, uh, an example system for, for this uh, session, a stellar mass binary with a disk that is ongoing with a lot of detailed information there. So if you haven't heard about this system, I think Catherine's uh, papers are an excellent uh, place to start.
and then maybe have any concluding comments, Sophie? <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, thank you uh, so much, Sophie. Let's thank them again.